like to make things simpler, there's two little principles. One's called the hedgehog principle, and the other is called big rocks. And these are the themes that I really operate on. So the hedgehog principle uh, comes from the book Good to Great by a guy called Jim Collins. And it's worth reading. It's a, it's a really interesting book. So he looked at 2,000 companies in the United States. And what his, what his aim was, was to see how come there were 20 companies or so that always were great. They made this leap from good to great. So no matter what the economy was like, these companies always made a profit. They always bought their product out on time. They were incredibly innovative. They never had a recall. And when their staff left them, their staff went on to be CEOs of another company and never said a bad thing about the company. So it's a really interesting read. What makes companies, people, great? And one of the things is the hedgehog principle. And the hedgehog principle comes from a fable. And this is what every CEO did um, as part of these 20 companies. A hedgehog is walking down a road and it's being stalked by a fox. Now the fox has many, many traits. It's got cunning and guile. It's got incredible sight, incredible smell. It's unbelievably fast. It's got good aerobic capacity and it can have great spring. So the sort of athlete we'd love to coach, I'm sure. And the hedgehog is going down the road and the fox decides to stalk it. So it makes its first move on the hedgehog and the hedgehog stops and curls up into a ball. And the fox doesn't know what to do. So it goes away, comes back with another cunning plan the following day and has another crack at the hedgehog. And just as it's about to tap, the hedgehog curls up into a ball and the fox can't get to it. So it goes away, third day, decides to attack the hedgehog from behind. So as it comes from behind, the hedgehog curls up into a ball. And this goes on for a few days until finally the fox gives up and goes away. And the moral of the fable, just do one thing, but do it bloody well. One thing. And as coaches, we need to do one or two things really well, really well. We can't be a master of everything. And it's shown that those people that can isolate and do the one or two things really well are successful. And that leads us to big rocks. So in sport, there are big rocks and there are one percenters, the small grains of sand that we hear, oh, this coach up here, he's doing this, or this coach in Queensland's doing that, or did you know they do that? And we tend to get sucked in a bit by the one percenters, thinking that that's going to provide us with the impetus to be successful. And it doesn't work that way, because what we do is we fill up a limited capacity in, our, in time and what our athletes can do with the one percenters and we try and tack the big rocks in later. So what do I mean by that? Compression guards. Okay, I get inundated with companies trying to sell us compression guards. So I get companies telling me we should wear compression garments before we fly, we should wear compression garments on the plane, we should comp wear compression garments after the plane trip, we should have them after the training, we should have them after a game, we should wear them at night. I've got all these things about compression garments. You can wear a thousand compression garments till the cows come on and they'll do no good if you're only getting three hours sleep a night. The big rock is sleep, not compression garments. The big rock in our sport is improving skill, being able to kick from here to Blair and hit him on the chest. Not spend $400,000 and take him to an altitude camp in Utah for a 3% gain, knowing that five of the 45 are non responders. Hey, the big rock's kicking better. But we don't think like that. We get pressured to act on the one percenters, and you need to identify the big rocks. What are the things that will genuinely make your athlete better and do them bloody well? The hedgehog principle. So we do the big rocks first. We sprinkle the one percenters around them when we're happy with the big rocks. And then we can put more, we call it the bucket. Athletes only have a, a, a certain amount they can do. We can put more in the bucket when we do the big rocks first. So 
One of the things you need to do when you finish here in Perth and go your own way, because I know you're focused on competition, is what are the big rocks that matter for your athletes? One of them might just simply be building a relationship so that there's trust on both sides and you can speak openly and honestly without a kickback and they can speak openly and honestly to you and you have a deep, meaningful relationship built around trust and vulnerability. That might be a big rock. Or it might just simply be get strong. And you can think about calves and quads and hamstrings, but what about just getting strong? Or improving the aerobic base and make that one thing. So it's an interesting concept. And we get sucked in because we hear what other people are doing. And you have to be strong as a coach. So I, I really would like you to remember that. I'm going to go through three strange things now about thinking. The first is this thing called constructivism. Because what we'd like our athletes to do is to be self-thinking, I'm sure. I do find it odd um, in athletics how much we coach in between jumps and or throws. And of course, yeah, we've got to give them technical feedback. But if I was still coaching athletics now, I can tell you I'd love an independent athlete who's going to make their own decisions in the heat of competition and not rely on me all the time. I, I really would like that. Yeah, I might have to say, we'll move your mark forward, or you're this far back from the pole, or get your chest up, whatever it might be, and I'll do it by signal. You can't do it in tennis, but it's certainly in track foot. But I want an independent, free-thinking athlete who's mentally tough and resilient, and I'd like them to be that on their own and not rely on me. Because if they rely on you, there's every chance that in the meat that matters most, you can't get there. And then you've got another problem that you've got to deal with, is where is my crutch? So, constructivism is the best way for deep learning for athletes, which is to give them a question, this is a message, pose them a message, and don't give them the answer. Don't tell them, ask, pose a problem. They filter it first, it changes the message once they filter it. So if I said that as a tall bloke, a tall bloke gets filtered by everyone what's tall. So they already have a different message of I'm thinking six foot five. They're thinking seven foot two. So they filter it. Then they make meaning of it. And then it goes into what they already know. What is a tall bloke? I follow the NBA, seven foot two is tall. Because the average seven NBA player is six foot eleven. And then they have mental models, which I'll talk about in a minute. And it crunches around, it crunches around, the message is different, and then out it comes. And they've actually, they actually have deeper learning when you're not telling them. So those people that are teachers there, there's these different um, stages. And we're probably not about creating, can you think of a way to, but would it be better if? What decision would you have made if your lace had broken just before you started. What would you do if your blocks weren't there? And instead of saying to them, if your blocks aren't there, go and grab someone else's blocks. We need to construct information. We need to pose them problems, and before you answer it for them, let them solve it, because you want deep learning. So constructivism is a very important part of coaching. This is another one of the three things I'd really like you to work away with today. Levels of perspective, right? Levels, and it comes from the, um, the work of a guy called Daniel Kim out of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So what is this? This is how we see things and where we spend our time. This is often where our time evaporates because we work at the lowest levels of perspective. We get less leverage down here. So what is this? So if I'm in a traffic jam and I'm running late for an appointment, right, and the, the sweat is starting to just form on my brow because I'm, I know I'm going to be late and this traffic's not moving. And all I can see in front of me are the brake lights of the car ahead. So I'm sitting there. The brake lights go off, the car moves, and then the brake lights come on and I stop and I'm stuck. And this goes on for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and later and later. I'm in the event. I'm at the event level of levels of perspective. I'm just sticking in it. If I could get out of the car and hop in a helicopter, 
and fly above the traffic jam and look down, I can see that if I just turn left at the next street and then turn left again and then turn right, I actually bypass the whole traffic jam, I get ahead of it and I'll get to the meeting on time. Same traffic jam, really different level of perspective. And as I say, you know, if I was explaining to our players, you, know, you need to work really hard at explaining things and then get them to construct. I say, boys, if you're trying to meet a girl and you're at a concert, don't go in the mosh pit. You've got to get to the balcony. They go, oh, yeah, yeah. So you want that balcony view, right? You've got to be able to. So as a coach, the most vision, mission, objective, strategy, tactics. You need to work at the higher levels and everything comes back to what you're trying to do with your vision. So if your vision, and I'll talk about it all, if your vision is he or she will be a better sprinter because they're stronger, everything you do is about strength. Don't put in a session of aerobic capacity. It doesn't fit your vision. If your vision is I want to connect with everyone's parents, you better have a system and structure in place to connect with everyone's parents and make sure you do it. So the vision is this big picture item. Now it's not this global thing, I'm going to change the world and then there'll be climate change. It can be my vision for this next three months. And your vision is built on mental models. And the mental models drive your vision and set up your system for your system to deal with events so you don't have to do it. One hamstring is an event. Don't change what you do because of one event. Ten hamstrings is a pattern of behaviour and your system's wrong. You need to change your system. But don't, get your, don't deviate from your vision because of one hamstring. So we need to be clear. One email, three texts, two phone calls. They're all events. They're distracting you from the big picture. So you better have in place a system to deal with the event so you can coach. So what are you going to do when you're coaching and training starts at 5 o'clock and your athlete gets there at 5.55 and you're already coaching the other group? You need a system in place to deal with someone that's late so you don't have to worry about it because you've got your vision that you're dealing with the people that are there on time, so you put in place a system. Otherwise you'll be, oh, I've got to deal with this event, they're late. Nah, don't deal with events. You get far more leverage when you're up this end, when you've got the big picture view. Now, mental models. Oh, sorry, I have a vision, I should. So my vision is to lead my department to maximise our potential, I don't need to read it out, but you've got key words. Key words are the things that create your vision. Lead, transparent. I don't want to hide things from my group. I'm open. I, I, I need to tell them what I see and why. Evidence-based. We're not going to take this supplement. There's no evidence. And it's always in the best interest of the player at club. Right? That's my vision for how I operate. And everything I do down here always relates to my vision. So when I need to make a decision, is it transparent, is it evidence-based, and is it the best interest of the player? You need to have three or four key words to construct your own vision. What are the three key things that define you as a coach? What are the things that really matter to you? It could be teach. It could be relate. But every one of you are different, and every one of you are different because you have different strengths, but you really do need a vision. Mental models. Mental models are our beliefs and assumptions. They actually guide us in whatever we do. And we, we get stuck in to people because we have a mental model and they have a different belief, they have a different mental model. So we need to be really clear on mental models. What are mental models? Well, it's how we see things. You know, do you see an old hag? or do you see a woman in a, in a fur coat? So it's the way we look at the world, and the way we look at the world affects what we do. If your grandparents voted Labor and your parents voted Labor, you're likely to vote Labor because you have a belief, a mental model that's been ingrained in you from their experiences. Um, there's a thing called the Y generation, or the millennials. But, but what is it exactly? We believe that they're different. 
That's our mental model, and we have to treat them differently. I treat them as humans. They're just people. But a lot of people have a mental model, they're different. Well, they might be, but not in my view. Um, the way a coach still play, defence wins games. No, attack wins games. No, I say defence wins games. That's a mental model. And then the way we view our fellow worker, you know, um, Neil Danaher, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with, with his drive for MND. His daughter was picked up one day when he, was, he worked in Perth, he was my boss at the Dockers. His daughter was being picked up by this guy to go out on a date, bloke knocked on the door, Neil opened the door, and standing there was the most tattooed man he'd ever seen. Not only was the guy covered in ink, he had more pieces of metal in his head than Neil could ever imagine. And Neil drew a mental model straight away about that guy, walked straight upstairs and said to his daughter, I don't think you should be going out with that guy. So he's, he's drawn an inference straight away from what he's seen in a mental model. The bloke was a surgeon. Right? But the mental model of what a surgeon should look like, what we believe one looks like, didn't fit that pattern. So our mental models have a great effect on us. So in footy, we have some cracker mental models. These are some of the beliefs. If you have a full pre-season, you're always <laughs> going to have a good, a good year, right? You would be the same. You would probably have a mental model. If you have a good pre-season, a good off-season, you're going to have a great track year, right? Fitness is the one I hate. Fitness is best demonstrated by the number of fourth quarters that you win. So if you lose the fourth quarter, you must be unfit. Well, they could be tired because you've trained them too much. You've also changed the strategies. The oppo also changed the strategies. And we had our best player off the ground. But it's a mental model. Fourth quarter, you've got to be back. That shows your fitness. Team camps facilitate bonding. They live with each other for 44 weeks a year and have lockers side by side. I think they bond. I don't think we need to send them away on a team camp, but if we want bonding, a mental model is send them away on a camp. Leadership groups. What about just a good leader? What about a great captain? Then we don't need a leadership group. Why do we have to run it by a popular vote? I'm not sure. Grappling and wrestling improve tackling. Every time we've done grappling and wrestling in pre-season, we've tackled worst in the year. And when we don't do it and work on intent, because tackling is intent, we're better. But they're mental models. I, you don't have to do this. But I bet you, you and your colleagues have some great mental models in track and field. Some real beliefs. Are they factual or are they just a mental model? And if you need to change mental models, you need evidence. You need evidence. So if you believe training on a Sunday is the most important day of the training week and you'll have a reason for it, that's a mental model. And if I said to you, no, I believe Saturday is, I need to give you evidence to change your mental model that Saturday is more important than Sunday. Right, so mental models, people, the people, parents, some of your athletes, Track and field officials all have mental models. Right? So, people go up what we call ladders. I see something, I draw data from it, therefore that means something, I'm going to draw an assumption from that, here's a conclusion, and then you act. And everyone goes up ladders. You know, everyone goes up ladders. And we have that phrase, when a player comes to me and says, Glenn, I don't think I can train tomorrow, something's happened, this is what's happened. I go up a ladder, and I believe he's trying to be lazy. That's the ladder I go up straight away, you lazy thing. Right? But that's because I've seen the situation, I've gathered data, he doesn't want to train. The meaning I make from that data is it's too hard to train. I've got an assumption that he's lazy. Yes, he's lazy. No. <laughs> No, you are training. <laughs> and, and I find out that his cat's died or something. You know? So we go up ladders. Right? Um, because of time, I won't um, run through some of these. Just the ladder. Do this one, and I'll just do a little bit on load management. This is the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition. We are striving for expertise in an area. 
but sometimes we're novices. So I might be an expert at AFL footy. I'm a novice dealing with AFLW football. Right? We don't, we can't be experts at everything. And you might be an expert at one thing, but you are a novice at some things. When I drive in Perth, I'm an expert. I've been driving for 40 years in Perth. When I get out of the plane at Charles de Gaulle Airport and hop in a car with the steering wheels on the other side, I'm on the other side of the road, the gear sticks on my right hand and the signs are in French, I'm a novice. So expertise is contextual. 